So I suppose a good starting point would be that this was very much this thinking, this 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 paper that's at the bottom left that um, I suppose is an anchor for what we're talking about that was published in 2016. It very much prompted by the publication in 2009 of the Commission to Inquire into Child Abuse Report, all five volumes. And um, that uh, known as the Ryan Report was specifically looking at institutions um, and reformatories and so on. And it came to the conclusion that in these institutions, in much of the 20th century, abuse was systematic, pervasive, chronic, excessive, arbitrary and endemic. It is an appalling report to read. It is obscene. I used to say to, to people when I was <laughs> lecturing student teachers in Venute on a regular basis, this is the most obscene document I've read in the 21st century. Um, now, a lot of the subsequent discussion, however, tended to focus on the fact that the institutions like Letterfrack and Dangan and places you've probably heard about, Upton and Cork and so on, they were run in the main, but not exclusively, by religious orders. And many of the perpetrators of the abuse, physical and sexual, were religious. Um, and therefore, we focused there, and there's also been the terrible reports about Klein and Ferns and Dublin uh, diocese and what happened there. And I suppose I was saying, all right, but as well as being religious, these people were, their occupation was teacher. They were teachers. So how come teachers can engage in this? This doesn't seem, this doesn't seem, there's some mismatch here. And we need, as well as having the discussion about the church's um, implication in all this, I was interested in saying, well, what are the educational consequences of the revelations of the Ryan report? And I'm really disappointed that we haven't had much discussion of the broader educational values and perspectives. Now, it's, it's probably understandable that as a society, 11 years on from the Ryan report, we still, in my opinion, haven't adequately engaged with with what it says. And, and you know, um, um, I'm not expecting after this that people will run away and read all five volumes of, of the Ryan report. But let me let me just give you a little flavor of what it said or what it concluded. Physical and emotional abuse and neglect were features of the institutions. Sexual abuse occurred in many of them. Schools were run in a severe regimented manner that imposed unreasonable and oppressive discipline on children and even on staff. And we pick up some of these themes as we go on. That was one of the conclusions. In other words, a fear of a climate of fear created by pervasive, excessive and arbitrary punishment permeated most of the institutions and all those run for boys. Children lived with the daily terror of not knowing where the next beating were coming from. Another one, the schools investigated revealed a substantial level of sexual abuse of boys in care that extended over a range from improper touching and fondling to rape with violence. Perpetrators of abuse were able to operate undetected for long periods at the core of institutions. And in the paper, I think I list six of the conclusions and I read, read three of them. And I don't know, I don't want to read the other three. I mean, I, I, it's so depressing and difficult uh, and, and, and heavy, heavy duty stuff um, um, to 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 even look um, back at the Ryan report. And. I think. It is important in terms of the revelations, and um, particularly the revelations of the 90s, that 
in 99, the then Taoiseach said, and this is worth looking at in, in some detail, on behalf of the state and of all citizens of the state, the government wishes to make a sincere and long overdue apology to the victims of childhood abuse for our collective failure to intervene, to detect their pain, to come to their rescue. So this is Irish society, on behalf of Irish society, the Taoiseach of the day, putting up his hand and saying, our collective failure. So this was a societal failure. That means we have to examine not just the institutions, but what was it in the wider society, in the wider culture that 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 facilitated or at least enabled or allowed uh, this to happen. Um, now, what I've done is looked at some 20th century writings, combinations of autobiography, memoir, and fiction, and said, well, we didn't have educational research to any great extent for much of the 20th century. But I'm a great believer that that writers, uh, particularly fiction writers, um, but also people who write autobiographies, do capture certain truths and do shed light on uh, on important important aspects of our lives, some of them uncomfortable. And I suppose back to the point I want to make about teachers and teaching. That on the one hand, we have systematic, pervasive, chronic, excessive, arbitrary and endemic. We're talking about abuse. And on the other hand, we now have a code of professional conduct for teachers 2016 from the Teaching Council that says the role the teacher is to educate and it's underpinned by respect, care, integrity and trust. So there's there's such a mismatch. Um, now, I know some people at this stage may be saying, ah, but all that has changed. So I would say, OK, if you think that, then hold on for a, a, a while and listen to some of what we say and we'll see if we can map map some of the pattern. So if I dive right into the kind of second half of the 20th century. Um, Gene Kerrigan is somebody a lot of people may be familiar with. He writes uh, sometimes quite a strong column on the back page of the Sunday Independent. He's a journalist, he's a novelist, and he has written um, uh, another country growing up in Ireland in the 1950s. And he, he talks about being in the primary school and he talks about his teacher, Mr. McAuliffe, and he's very keen to point out that Mr. McAuliffe was a kind man doing his duty. His duty was this. Mr. McAuliffe, kind man, gentle man, hefted the bamboo cane and brought it slashing down on my outstretched palm. The pain shot through my right hand, stinging, eye watering. I held my arm outstretched, waiting, trying to keep my face expressionless. Mr. McAuliffe slowly raised the cane again, lowered it gently to my palm, touched the palm once, twice, like a golfer teeing up a ball. Then he raised the cane again, my hand reddened and burning, my arm involuntary shied away from the bamboo. And then Kerrigan says, it was called slapping, a trivializing euphemism for violence our own trivializing name for it was biffing. When you got biffed, it was never a token slap. The master prepared each slashing assault with all the concentration that a Croke Park hurler applied to belting what was likely, whoops, that line shouldn't be there, to be the next, to be the last free in an All-Ireland final. 10 seconds left in the match, score even. And then Jean Kerrigan, talks from the primary school to he went to the vocational school, the tech in Finglas in Dublin. And this to me is where we get into nuance. In other words, it isn't always about brutal violence. At tech, they didn't hit us. Violence was reserved for national school. And one day I did something or didn't do something and it was time to show me who was boss and the teacher told me to stand up. He was a confident type, a seasoned pro, none of the let's be friends crack about him. He began to needle me, to mock me. With his adult skills, his facility with words, his ability to wield, to wield sarcasm, he could twist me and turn me on the spot, and he did. 
Later he says, I remember nothing of the detail of that incident except one aching wish that filled my mind. I was humiliated, red faced, willing him to end it. Please let me sit down, pick on someone else. I hadn't the necessary verbal skills to protect myself, my ego, my pride from the relentless contemptuous assault. And I remember wishing with all my heart that it was like it used to be in national school. Then I could just hold out my hand, take the pain and let it be over. When you're determined to hurt a kid, you don't have to to have a cane to do it. And I suppose I, I, I said I begin with Kerrigan because I think he's a kind of good witness to the fact that this was quite pervasive, what I call casual cruelty, and it was culturally embedded. It was part of the fabric of schooling. Now, I can imagine some of you are thinking, oh, but this is very historical, Jerry. This is, you know, we abolished corporal punishment in 1982. And that's true. And that was an important milestone. But look at the last sentence there. When you're determined to hurt a kid, you don't have to have a cane to do it. So just because we abolished corporal punishment doesn't necessarily say we have abolished cruelty in the classroom. OK. Now, Seamus Dean, um, Seamus Dean's book, Reading in the Dark, published in the 90s. Um, it's defined as, I think, an, a kind of autobiography stroke novel in that technically it's fiction, but it's very clearly based on his own experience. And he describes a maths class in 1951 in um, the school he attended um, in Derry, the same school that produced Nobel Prize winners um, like John Hume and Seamus Heaney and so on. And it is a frightening account. It's, it's too long to, to quote it here, but it is a chapter worth reading of the absolute abuse of power. It is you're at the top of the class. It's your show. You're in charge. People are afraid of you. People are trapped and you can wield the power. Um, another man. Probably about the same age who went to school with the Christian brothers in Newry is a man called Brian Cosgrove. And as was often the habit then, um, people doing honours mats came in on a Saturday morning for um, special classes. And he recounts a particular Saturday morning where he says, this boy, Niall Kelly, a most likable youth without malice, but utterly devoid also of anything approaching academic ability. He was usually astute enough to keep out of big trouble, but it was. But if he did get into hot water, he usually took his punishment, perhaps a few biffs from the leather strap on the open palms with an amiable stoicism remaining unruffled by what was a recurrent event. Perhaps it was this very imperviousness that drew down on his head the full wrath of our frustrated trigonometry teacher, himself the victim of his painful sinuses and resolved to create a fellow victim. He continues. At the end of an hour's humiliation. He says this was no longer Nile, but an unrecognizably pathetic and broken creature reduced to sniveling inarticulacy. And there followed on from this a sense of guilt changed by frustrated rage that not one of us had the authority to intervene and end a display of savagery that had unfolded before us. And he was writing this in his, I think he probably wrote this um, memoir in his 60s. And he was saying he was still haunted by that experience, but also by the compliance that everybody in the class went along with this outrageous abuse. Power differential point. But then 
there's another strand in um, when you put them all together that I began to notice. And that is what I call the juxtaposition of pain and happiness. So there's nine pages in Sean O'Fuelon's um, autobiography, Vive Moi, published in 1963. And they're really a wonderful and beautifully written account of his schooling. And he begins, the first school of his sent to us as cracked as blazes. Um, and he goes on to describe a huge amount of horror on his part at seeing um, the Christian brothers um, visit, taking down the pants of boys and, and um, slapping them on the backside and so on. And he recounts what happens to this boy, Feeney. And he then challenges the reader, and he was writing this in the mid 60s. It is possible that certain manly readers of these lines will laugh at me and say that it probably was no more than Feeney deserved or say that they themselves often got leathered and add the usual phrase that it didn't do them a bit of harm as if they could possibly be sure of this. And that's a that's a smart observation, I think, by Ophelon. And then he goes on, having told us this, that the place was cracked, that it was violent, that there were outbursts of violence, that um, he obviously disagrees with that idea that Feeney deserved it. And then he says, in spite of the cold, the dirt, the smells, the poverty and the vermin, we managed to create inside this crumbling old building a lovely, happy, fairy world. So this to me is a fascinating um, uh, reality that when you ask people about their schooling, that on the one hand, they can tell you about dreadful things that happened. And on the other hand, they can say, ah, but it was a happy time and it was OK. So if I talk about my teaching in the 70s in Kilkenny, where we would have had quite a number of students from St. Joseph's, a um, child care facility, maybe a dozen at a time, like at any one time, we might have had a dozen students in the school from St. Joseph's. And when you read the Ryan Report section on St. Joseph's, it's very painful. It's very difficult reading, um, especially when you've known some of the people. And what, what continually strikes me when I meet some of those former students is that on the one hand, they will tell you there were two um, lay staff um, convicted in court of sexually abuse, abusing those children. And they will tell you about them and they'll name them and they'll talk about them and they'll say how bad it was. And then on the other hand, many of them would say, actually, we had a lot of fun there. We had a lot of happy times there. And some of the people who are mentioned, anonymized in the Rhine report, but I recognize them as real people I knew. So so the, the woman who was in charge, um, some of the people would, would demonize her and others have told me how they thought she was wonderful because she was effectively um, a mother figure for them and a warm mother figure for them. So this is nuanced and complicated. It's not a black and white story. And I thought that was good. I also like good, good illustration from from Ophelan and worth reading. Um, and I'm conscious when looking at um, any Irish writer, uh, particularly male writers, that the big shadow everyone operates under is James Joyce. Um, so in Portrait of an Artist as a Young Man, he has an incredibly graphic account of um, Father Dolan, the prefect of studies, walking into this class and Stephen Dedalus, the, the character that, that's obviously based on Joyce's own experience, has broken his glasses and therefore has been excused. Um, um, and Father Dolan walks in uh, and any boys want flogging here, Father Arnal cried the prefect of studies. Any lazy, idle loafers that want flogging in this class. And he proceeds to um, cane um, 
Stephen Dedalus. And what emerges in the aftermath is a very interesting situation where the, the, the dilemma is, will when, when they get to the, the principal, the, the rector, Father Conmey, will Father Arnal stand up to the prefect of studies? Will, uh, for Stephen, who he, who's in the right, or will he allow that authoritarian reality prevail? And of course, you don't need me to tell you, um, you know, Father Arnal doesn't stand up. And that's a huge lesson for the young um, Stephen Dedalus about adults, about adults in power differential situations. And this, to me, has huge implications for staff rooms, for um, how schools are run, how educational institutions are run, how a church is run, um, in terms of do people feel free to, to challenge authority, part of the point that was being made earlier. And then you link back to the Ryan report. Authoritarian management in all schools meant that staff members were afraid to question the practices of managers and disciplinarians. So that was a tradition and that was how people can get away with it. And that's how bullying cultures can thrive. And um, you might have noticed I, I got a bit ahead of myself and I wanted to go back. One of the few accounts of life in an institution is a very sad story of a man called Peter Tyrrell, who was in Letter Frack in the 20s and who in the 1950s, when Owen Sheehy Skeffington, then a senator, was beginning to mount a campaign against corporal punishment and meeting a lot of resistance. But he encouraged um, Peter Tyrrell to write down um, his, his account, which he did. And um, he had very little formal education, Peter Tyrrell, but it's, and it, it, everything in that book, Founded on Fear, has a... Um, a great ring of authenticity about it. And he describes the teachers, but again, it's 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 not a black and white picture, even though, as I'll tell you in a minute, um, there's a sad end to this story, very sad end. So the principal was called Brother Keegan, very religious, fond of a drink, but never to excess, a strict disciplinarian, very hard and can be a very cruel man. It was Keegan's practice to come to the square, always carrying a stick. He often took several boys away and flogged them severely with their pants off. The reason for this flogging was because of improper actions which are said to have taken place in the dormitories and lavatories. Keegan is just as severe on the other Christian brothers and masters as on the children. So here we get this. This authoritarianism doesn't just extend to the children, but it also extends to, to one's, one's colleagues, one's peers. And then he goes on to give, uh, I, I'm going to skip over that. You can read that in your own time. That, he, you know, he's very, he's very fair, I think, Peter Tyrrell is, to... Um, the the other members of the staff and and can see the good and the not so good in in people. Um, why I say the sad ending was in 1967, Peter Tyrrell's body was found um, burnt on Hampstead Heath. A sad end to a um, and the, that book wasn't published until the 21st century. Um, so Joyce. Um, so I'm beginning to say not only do you have the juxtaposition of the good and the bad, uh, or the accounts that tell you about the pain, but also tell you about the fun and the happy memories. I also think it's important, even what I said already about girls' education, that that's not a single uniform story either. So um, Maura Mockenty, writing as Maura Cruz O'Brien, um, the same age as the state is her autobiography, um, went to school in Dunqueen. And um, she says, I must say, I never saw anyone hit for anything other than failure at lessons. So that little anecdote we just heard about the girl struggling with the Irish at the back of the class and the teacher losing it and pulling her out is uh, sadly, you know, more widespread than, than maybe we realize. We were all too docile and or cowed for actual misbehavior. 
In other words, they were they were so compliant and they were so quiet that they weren't causing any trouble. Just didn't know that. And then Edna O'Brien, who, as many of you know, is a great chronicler of um, Ireland, particularly um, second half of the 20th century. But her account, she loved school. And she says, you know, 300 women, the prevailing smell of wax. This was boarding school in Loch Ray. The prevailing smell of wax, floor polish, ewers of freezing water and cabbage. Dour years in which I came to love Latin, profane temptations, falling in love, rules, friendship, penances and hilarities, the school play, constant study, without any reference to corporal or sexual abuse. So if anyone was going to tell it like it was, it would be Edna O'Brien and there was nothing. So that I love that phrase. If you know the Nigerian novelist Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, she has this great line about beware the single story. And it seems to me this is a really important message in this discussion about what happened, whether it's the Ryan report, whether it's schooling broadly in Irish society in the past, beware the single story. Uh, staying with that, Mary Robinson, sorry, um, um, Nola Fuelon, um would say when she was sent to, I'm trying to remember whether it's Carrie McCross or Monaghan, to St. Louis Sisters as a boarder, I have no doubt that being sent to this school was the biggest single stroke of luck in my life. And again, you know, Edna O'Brien <coughs> is somebody who tells it like it is. Nulo Fuelon told it like it was. Similarly, Mary Robinson, no references to brutality, casual or otherwise, um, in, in, in that school. And then you have somebody like McGahern. So there's a great account of McGahern, his father taking him out of school. And him being out in the fields and the presentation brother getting on his bicycle from Carrick and Shannon going out and um, um, confronting the father in the field and saying this boy should be in school and him convincing the father that he should send John to school and he would had not a great experience in the previous school but he, next thing is the fear and drudgery of school disappeared without realizing it to the pleasures of the mind i was beginning to know and love the world the brothers took me in sat me down and gave me tools i look back on my time there with nothing but gratitude as years of luck and privilege and of grace actual grace so beware the single story now i'm very conscious that sometimes depending on the forum you're in if you say this and this being the a lecture for the Irish Institute of Catholic Studies. You can be accused if you use that quotation. Oh, you're minimizing it, you're reducing it. And, and that's not the intention. The intention is to try and grasp some of the complexity that, of course, it wasn't universal experience. But I am totally fascinated by the Ophelon observation that you can you can experience negativity and positivity in the same institution. <clears throat> Now, um, and maybe I'll continue and and we'll we'll hear about Italy and we'll um um yeah this is a, this is the next two themes are important. So you begin to detect from a particularly from the seventies on the beginning of some resistance. Maybe I maybe some of the writings from the sixties, although difficult to. You know, it's not a, it's not an immediate change. It's a gradual change. So Paul McGrath talks about being at school in Sally Noggin um, in the 70s. And um, he was um, in a, a Church of Ireland run um, home. And um, for those who don't know, he's a footballer, but he is of mixed race. So he's um an Irish mother and Nigerian father, and um, he says so. So he's very, he writes very eloquently about being being a little different and what that what that um, what that was like. So the teacher walked up behind me and smacked me across the back of the head. I was absolutely furious. He'd hit me for no reason. So I just jumped straight up and went for him, head for leather. A few of the lads rushing to my support jumped on top of him too. There was absolute pandemonium, and I think a few of us came close to being expelled. So that's very different from the compliance that we find in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. I couldn't, I can't find any evidence of an incident like this. And then um, Roddy Doyle, 
who, as you probably know, um, was a teacher, uh, taught in, in Greendale Community School in Kilbarrick for many years before becoming a full time writer. In that, I think it's called the Henry Smart Trilogy. Um, the third book sees the Henry Smart character. So this is fiction. So Henry Smart is back in Ireland, having been in the United States, and um, he gets a job as a caretaker in a school. And I think it is quite significant that uh, that, that episode of the book where he talks about being a caretaker. And the caretaker is walking along and he's standing outside the classroom and he's listening. I counted them, four, five, the sixth. Six was as many as I'd tolerate. Six of the famous best. Three whacks on each open hand with a leather strap. The limit, I'd allow no more. Then I heard the seventh and the eighth, the ninth, the tenth. I heard the objections killed in the throats of 54 witnesses, the silent outrage and the terror. I was outside. The boys were inside, watching a brute lose control of himself, living it and being destroyed by it. And he goes on to tell how he confronts this, this teacher, a man in his 20s, claims he was from Kilkenny, and um, he, he says, you've got to stop that. And he says, no one was slapped except in the days when I stayed at home. I'd made my own republic. Now, the book is called The Dead Republic. So this is very telling use of that phrase, his own republic, inside the railing of the school. And you can, you can sense Roddy Doyle's rage that who was going to stand up to the teacher? And bearing in mind what we said already about the who was cowed by bullying types and authoritarian types. And he puts it in the hands of the caretaker as the one who's going to try and break the pattern. And that beginning of resistance has a huge reflection in reality with um, a movement that began in the 60s for the abolition of corporal punishment in schools. And some of this, one of the <coughs> leading characters in this was a man, a doctor called Cyril Daly. And he, he wrote a memoir in 2009, and he said, referring back to the 60s, it was not possible for a Catholic parent to find a Catholic boys school, either primary or secondary, where corporal punishment was, was not part of the essential matrix of Catholic education. Corporal punishment and sexual abuse are not discrete entities. They are a morbid and ineluctable continuum. So that campaign gathered a lot of momentum in the 60s. Um, the Sunday Independent was involved. I think they gathered about 8,000 signatures. People got to the minister. Minister at the time, late 60s, said, no, we're not going to abolish it yet anyway. Then we had the 1970 Kennedy Report on Industrial Schools. So we're beginning to see a much greater awareness, the beginning of that resistance. I mean, the Kennedy Report was gave great hope to to um, to people working in childcare and or working with uh, marginalized young people that this was going to be the end of industrial schools. It was going to better deal for children in poor, poorer communities. But it would took until 19, I have 1980 there. That should be 1982, my apologies. Um, John Boland was the Minister for Education in 1982. Um, one of my uh, colleagues when I was working in Furhouse did a master's in Trinity. <clears throat> and um, he interviewed um, Boland, but he didn't, he didn't, he doesn't have a recording. So it's difficult to corroborate it because John Boland um, died shortly after Michael did the interview. And uh, Boland was um, a kind of rough at the edges kind of politician, a straight talking guy who had gone to school in Sing Street and would have said to echo what O'Foylon said, um, well, it never did me any harm, um, um, you know, knocked the edges off me and so on. And um, but um, the story, as I recall it from Michael, was that he said 
one Friday evening, a, a senior figure in the department handed him a folder and said, um, Minister, we're going to have a conversation about corporal punishment. Um, maybe you should take this file home for the weekend and read it. And Boland says he was appalled, shocked, horrified with what he read that weekend and came into the department on the Monday morning and said, we're abolishing corporal punishment. And at that stage, a lot of Europe had abolished corporal punishment and, and so on. So there's a sense in which, OK, the leather strap, if you, you see it on the right, that's what they looked like. Um, that that, oh, that was all fine. That went in, in, in 1982. Um, <clears throat> whether the authoritarianism went with it is, I think, an open question. Um, would we would we hear from the 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 um, the group comments questions disagreements? You have to stop the recording.